Santa Fe, which is not where I'm at. I am uh, on the East Coast, but that didn't work out due to the COVID-19 issue. So I'm, I'm happy to be in Santa Fe in some way during, during this month. So, um, so I'm going to start with a story. So a long time ago, longer than I'm willing to admit to, I was sitting in a small, cramped, cold room in an old tuberculosis hospital. And a couple things you should know about, about that hospital, about me. It was no longer a tuberculosis hospital. It was a detox center, but it looked just like an old tuberculosis hospital you would expect it would look like. And as for me, I was homeless. I was a heroin addict. I weighed 100 pounds, so take about 50 pounds off me today. I had hepatitis C, and I had recently been arrested for a number of felonies and was looking at potentially going to jail for about 50 years. And that's when they made me a very wonderful offer, and they said, we think you really need our 28-day treatment program. And I said, no. I don't think so. I mean, I had so much going on. You know, I got, I've got a lot to, lot to give to the world. I got to get back out there. And I said, no. And so I went back to my room. And as I was sitting there, I had what we describe in recovery as a moment of clarity. And that moment of clarity was, I think I'm going to die if I go back out there. And so I went back to them and I said, you know what? I will, after all, I will go into your 28-day treatment program. And that was the beginning of long-term recovery for me. Now, the reason I tell that story is because if this was a Hollywood movie, we would bring that moment up as like, this is the big moment. This is like the most important thing. And while it is an important moment, and while, you know, I can delineate a, a, a path before and after, it's honestly not any more important than the countless moments since and the countless positive decisions that I made since that moment till today. The number of meetings that I went to, my calling my sponsor, helping other people, praying, meditating, making a decision an hour a day at a time not to drink or use. Those are all equally important. And so I know I'm in a Zen meeting, and in Zen, we tend to believe a lot. We talk about the big moments, the Ken shows, the Satori's, right? And they are important. But also, and what I want to talk about tonight are all these little moments, all the little things that we do over and over and over and over again that add up over time. And so what I'm going to talk about tonight is something, it's a program I've created called Spiritual Habits. And so what are spiritual habits? Really, they are, it's, it's the idea is it lies at the intersection of spiritual principles, things like mindfulness is a spiritual principle, generosity is a spiritual principle, right? So spiritual principles and behavior science. So how do we create habits? And so in addition to the podcast that Henry shared, another big thing that I do is I do a lot of coaching work with people. And I primarily think of myself as a behavior coach. Because one of the things that I believe really strongly in is that sometimes we can't think our way into right action. We have to act our way into right thinking. And so I became very interested in, okay, what what do we know about how people change? And it turns out there's a lot of science about it. So tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the behavioral science side of spiritual principles than the spirit of spiritual habits than I am the spiritual principles because you guys, you guys probably know your spiritual principles pretty well, right? So I'm going to spend a little bit more time about that. But again, spiritual habits are this intersection of spiritual principles and behavior change. They're things that we can do throughout our day to remember and take action on the spiritual principles that we want to embody. It's a method of taking spiritual ideas and giving them more of a practical implementation in the world. So 
near my house, there's a place called Antrim Lake. And it's, a, it's probably more a big pond than it's a lake, but we'll call it a lake. And you can walk around it. There's a lovely trail that goes around it. It's a paved gravel trail. And, and it's a nice trail. And that's where lots of people walk. What very few people know is if you drop off the side of that trail, about 15 feet away is another series of trails. And these trails go through the woods. They go along the river. There's beautiful, stunning American sycamore trees. It's, this, it's a different, altogether more powerful, more beautiful place. And yet, it's like 10 feet away from this other trail. And I often think of spiritual habits this way. We often think about, I need more time to practice. I need to be able to get away for a week. I need to be able to, and, and spiritual habits are intended to be, as you go about your day, you know, just make a slight little detour, 10 feet off the path. And there's this world of beauty that sits right there. And so spiritual habits are intended by and large to be things that we do as we go about our day. Now, meditation is a type of spiritual habit. It's something we set aside time for. I'm not going to talk about meditation because most of you are probably pretty active um, and consistent meditators. If you're not, you can apply everything I'm going to talk about to a meditation practice. But so that's what spiritual habits are and, and how I think about them. Um, and so. There's a lot that we know about behavioral principles these days around how to create sustainable habits, about the nature and mechanics of our tendencies, our inclinations, basic neuroscience. It has become a real field. So I'm going to go into that in a minute, but I want to start with what I think the fundamental biggest problem to spiritual practice, to a lot of spiritual practice is, and I think it's that we forget. If you're anything like me and you've got a somewhat busy life, I get up in the morning and I might start my morning with a, with a reading, you know, I, read, I, I get to read lots of wonderful things from lots of authors for my podcast. Um, so I'm reading something inspirational and spiritual. I might sit down and meditate for a while. I orient myself, these big ideas, and then I jump into my day. And the next time I might think about any of those things is that night as I'm laying down to bed and reflecting on my day and I go, oh yeah, I, boy, I meant to be mindful today or I meant to be compassionate or I meant to be present. And so forgetting is a really big problem. Forgetting also turns out to be a really big problem in behavioral science. And it's something that we've spent time trying to solve. So a lot of what I'll be talking about is how do we not forget? So what I want to do is now move into some basic behavior science. And I think the really important thing here is that a lot of us have a tendency to believe that we are a certain way, right? And boy, a very, very fundamental part of Zen practice is to say you're not what you think you are, right? But we tend to, particularly with things like discipline, we think, oh, I'm the kind of person who just can't stick with things. I can't stick with exercise. I can't finish what I start. Uh, I'm just not somebody who's good at that. And what we know is that a lot of times we are better at those things than we think. We just haven't learned. And so that's the most exciting part of behavioral science to me is that it says we can really change. I have coaching clients who come to me all the time and they're like, I just can I've never been able to stick with exercise. I'm not that kind of person. And I'll say to them, it's not you, it's your approach. So let's work on your approach and let's see if we can set aside let's see if we can set aside these preconceived notions of what you can and can't do. So, so what I'd ask you all to do briefly is just reflect for a moment on, on two quick things for me before we move on. The first would be, are there any spiritual principles, things like generosity, mindfulness, compassion, that you would like to pr practice more in your life, but you really kind of have trouble, you know, bringing it out of when you occasionally think about it into 
more of the moments of your life. So reflect on that. If you have one, you can get it and bear it in mind. And then secondly, do you have any of these preconceived notions about your ability to change? And, and so reflect on those two things for just a moment before we move forward, because I think it helps, it'll help make everything else I'm about to talk about a little bit more uh, orienting for you. So I'll give you just a second to do that while I have a quick sip of water. So I'm going to tell one more story, well, not one more story, but one more story now about change because it's easy to think, well, you know, I'm the kind of person who can't or, and I want to talk about change. I mentioned being a heroin addict, right? And there was once upon a time, I would have probably robbed you at gunpoint if you were carrying a big bottle of, of you know, oxycodone or something like that, right? Well, this summer, last summer, I guess, my mom hurt her back. And I was, I was one of the primary people who took care of her. And one of the things that I had to do each week was I would go to the pharmacy and I would pick up her bottle of oxycodone. And I delivered it to her every week. And it was really about a month of doing this before it even occurred to me what I was doing. Where it even occurred, so for a month, I just picked it up and delivered it like I was picking up a turkey. You know, like I don't eat turkey. I don't care. I bring her a turkey. Didn't have any. So I tell that story not to be like, look how great I am, because that's not it. I tell that story to say, we can really change a lot more than we think we can. Henry's book is a great example about this, right? He talks about being a very different person now than he used to be, right? So that's, that's, the promise that both spiritual practice and behavior change has. We can really become different people. So if you've got some of those limiting beliefs, if you can just, to the best of your ability, say, well, maybe I'm not right about that. I'm going to open my heart. Because if you had told me all those years ago that I would go to the grocery and pick up a bottle of, of opiates like that and deliver to my mom, I would have said, you are nuts. Maybe I can get sober. Maybe I can get sober and not be miserable. But what you're asking for, that's going way too far. Like there's no way. And yet, there it is. And again, I don't say that to be like, look how great I am. That's really a testament to the principles and the things I've learned over the years. So let's jump into behavior change science. And what I'm going to do is I am going to share... Um, something called the fog behavioral model that I think is the simplest way to teach some really important behavior change concepts. There's a Stanford researcher by the name of BJ Fogg, who's one of the leading, uh, leading lights in behavior change today. He's a brilliant guy. I've, had, I've, been, I've been lucky enough to talk to him a couple times. He's got a great book called Tiny Habits. But he created this model, and I want to walk through it because I think it speaks to some really fundamental ideas, and it, it allows us to understand them quickly. He basically says that behavior occurs when motivation, which is over here on our left axis, ability, which is down here on our horizontal axis, and prompts come together at the same time. So behavior happens above this action line. So what does this tell us? At its most basic level, what this says is, and it's completely common sense, if you want to do something that's really hard to do, you need to have a sky-high level of motivation. So, for example, if you want to sit and meditate for 24 hours straight, you've got to be real motivated to do that, like super motivated. If, on the other hand, you want to meditate for five minutes, you can be, which is way over here on the easy-to-do side, you can have pretty low motivation, right? So what this tell, and the problem with motivation is there's two key problems with it. One, it goes up and down. You've probably noticed this. I'm motivated today. Tomorrow, I feel, I feel like crap. I don't want to do it. I'm more motivated today. Motivation goes a little up and down. And secondly, motivation is somewhat hard to control. There are some things we can do to work with it but it's a harder variable to, to control. So what's an easier variable to control is our ability. 
And by ability, what I mean is how hard something to do is. So the e I made a meditation example. Another example would be um, easy to do is to go walk around the block. Hard to do is run for 10 miles. Again, if you want to go run for 10 miles every day, you've got to be super motivated. But an interesting thing happens when we start with something small and easy to do and do it consistently. Two things occur. One is our motivation tends to go up. And secondly, that thing gets easier. I walk around the block. Now it's easier. I do that for a week. Now I can go around the block twice and it's still the same level of easy. Before long, I'm running a mile and it's the same level of easy. So what this points to is if we're trying to make a change in our behavior that we struggle with, we are very well served to bring down the amount that we're trying to do and then keep doing it consistently over time because that'll improve our motivation and it will get, it'll become easier to do. So that's a really fundamental piece of, as you look in your own life, if, there's, if you want to design new habits or new behaviors, starting smaller than you think is often really, really important. So I love that part of this model because it explains very clearly why small steps work. The second part of this model that is really important is prompts. Being reminded to do something is really, really important and um, we need to do it. But if we get prompts at the, at the wrong time or if we're trying to do something, then prompts are going to fail there, but they're going to succeed above the line. So that's the FOG behavioral model. There's a lot more implications of it, but, but very quickly I wanted to share those basic implications because they're really important for what we're going to talk about next. And they're really important for behavior change in general. And I will, at the end of this, uh, take any questions. So if you have any questions, you can feel free to uh, save them up and uh, I'll, I'll be happy to answer them if any of this is confusing. All right. So moving on now to the next part of teaching points is the triggers. I want to talk about triggers or we call them pro prompts in that model. They are ways that we are reminded. And I want to talk about the different types because there's a variety of them. And being able to use different ones at different times is really helpful and is a really important part of the spiritual habits program. So the simplest prompt or trigger that we're all used to is a time-based one. Oh, 3 p.m. I do this right? You have a reminder go off or you have your calendar and you go 3 p.m. I do this. Very straightforward, very simple, far and away the most common. And the reason it's common is because it's remarkably effective. Pretty straightforward, really important one. The, the second would be location, right? You can be prompted to do something by your location. It's interesting because when we talk about bad habits, location is often a real driver. Location is often a real driver of bad habits. Oh, I walk into the kitchen and the next thing I know I'm eating a brownie, right? The, the kitchen is a trigger. It's a prompt to me that I want a brownie. Um, but we can use them in a positive way too, right? We can use the location. When I arrive at a certain place, when I get to a certain place, I, I will do this. Another one is a preceding event. This is called anchoring or habit stacking. This is a really powerful one. I've had a lot of success with coaching clients where we'll do something like, when I get back from walking the dog, then I will meditate. Because walking the dog is something that happens every single morning. Or after I make my coffee, then I will read some inspiring literature, right? Because making their coffee is something that happens. So you can, you can use a preceding event that happens consistently to trigger you to do the next event. This is really helpful, particularly if you don't follow a really tight schedule like, oh, 8.15, I do this. 8.30, I do that, right? If it's a little bit more like, well, I get up, I walk the dog, I make my coffee, you know, sometime in the morning, uh, a preceding event can be really helpful. Another type of trigger is our emotional state. And again, this is one that is commonly used uh, against us, right? More often than not, our emotional state prompts us to take an action that we don't want to take. I'm stressed, so I have a drink. Uh, I'm depressed, so I turn on Netflix, right? So, but 
our emotional state can be a really useful trigger also for the positive. And we'll talk more about this when I give some illustrations of spiritual habits, because a lot of the things that we're trying to do in our spiritual life, a lot of our growth opportunities actually come out of difficult emotions. And so if we can use our difficult emotions or our difficult thoughts as a trigger, if we can allow those things to, to prompt us to go, oh, I'm feeling this, so now this. It can be a really effective one. It's a hard one because that's the challenge. We, it's one of the hardest to implement because we have to be much more aware in order to do it, but it's a really powerful type. Um, other people can be prompts. You know, Someone else can say, hey, let's do this. So other people can be prompts. And then the final one, I'm just generally calling technology. And by technology, I actually mean something fairly specific that I've had a lot of success with people with. And there's a series of apps out there that we can tell to just ping us randomly. There's one on the iPhone called Mind Jogger that I use with clients a lot. And you can say, hey, ping me nine times between 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. And when it goes off, it can display a message. And so this can be a way to interrupt us from a thought state to wake up and go, oh, oh, I want to do this, right? So it's a very powerful tool against forgetting. So those are some behavior change ideas. And then the last behavior change piece that I want to walk through is the idea, they're called, um, they're called implementation intentions, or we could call it just being specific. But the way they work is basically, if this, then that, or when this, then that. So, when I finish walking the dog, I'll meditate is an implementation intention. If I find myself um, ruminating about my mother being a pain in my you-know-what, then I will say the loving-kindness prayer. That's an implementation intention. And what it points to is that in behavior change of any sort, specificity is always our friend and ambiguity is always our enemy. Because when we have to both decide what we're going to do and then do it, we're way less likely to do it. So separating decision from action is a really useful thing. And that's what an implementation intention does. So all I have to do is watch for the, the trigger, then perform the event. So it's, a, it's an if then or a when then. But by knowing what they are and writing them down, they can be really, really effective. So again, in anything you're trying to do behavior change wise, specificity is your friend. So if we were going to be talking specifically about procrastination, which is something I help people with a ton, you know, I always say that ambiguity is one of the mothers of procrastination. You really, it really is a problem. So specificity is really important. You know, a lot of times if you look at our task, if, if you look at a lot of our to-do lists, what you'll find is our to-do lists are not specific tasks. They're like small projects, you know. Uh, you know, I'll get something on mine like uh, launch new course, which is like 64 tasks. No wonder when I, when I look at it, I'm like, I'll go to the next one, which is call doctor. That's easier, you know? So, so that's an example of ambiguity being, as well as overwhelm being a real problem. So that's the, that's the heart of some basic behavior change science. There's a lot of stuff out there, but if you can remember those sort of key principles, which is start small, Make sure you have a trigger and get specific. You'll be well on your way to making changes of any sort that you want to make. So the other key foundation of the spiritual habits program or idea really is best said by an old Tanzanian proverb that says, little by little, a little becomes a lot. Little by little, a little becomes a lot, right? And it's a really important idea. And if we go back to the fog behavioral model I showed you, we can see why doing things that are really easy a little bit 
we can get we can get away with doing those with much less motivation. So that's why doing things that are little is really important. We talked about my briefly about my podcast where Henry was a guest, and um, one of the things that I said very often early on on the show was, um, "You'd be surprised what a series of small steps taken over and over and over again will accomplish." And it was interesting because I was reflecting on this the other day as I was preparing for this talk, and I went, "Wow, you know." we've done 350 some episodes, you know, we've had, you know, somewhere, I don't know, 17, 18 million downloads that happened little by little, a little became a lot. I didn't do that in one fell swoop. I did it day after day, reading, preparing for my guests, preparing for my guest, interviewing the guest, releasing the podcast, going on Twitter and sharing done little, 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 little over and over and over and over again. And so, um, this is, a, this is a really fundamental idea. So back to reflecting, right? We reflected a little bit earlier on what's a spiritual principle that we might want to, we might want to embody. We reflected on what are some beliefs that we might have about ourselves. The reflection I would give you now is, is there anything in your life that if you just started and you applied this principle to, little by little, a little becomes a lot that might change your life? Is there anything that you might apply this principle to? So again, I'll give you just a second to reflect on that. All right. Well, we'll uh, hopefully you are able to, to think of something, but I wanna tell, another story about somebody in recovery. And this is my friend, Rachel, who tells a story that makes me laugh every time, but I think it's perfect for this. Rachel was a, was a alcoholic years and years ago. She's been in recovery a long time. You don't need to worry about her. She's good. Um, she's this sweet little girl who was once arrested for armed robbery, which cracks me up seeing her in a ski mask and a gun. I'm like, that can't even be true. Anyway, she lived with these people, these, these other women who had to put up with her, and they would get really frustrated with her because she just wouldn't pay the rent. But every night, they'd see her sitting out on the porch with a six-pack, maybe smoking a joint, and they'd say, Rachel, how come you always have money to buy beer and to buy weed, but you can't pay the rent? And Rachel was baffled by this. She would say, that's ridiculous. Beer's like $6. And I paid like $20 for the bag of weed. Rent's like $200. Rachel did not understand <laughs> at all that little by little, a little becomes a lot. This principle, she could not grasp it. And a lot of us are this way sometimes in our own lives. We go a little, and eh, it's not gonna get me anywhere. That's not going to pay the rent. That's not going to get you 350 podcast episodes. But the reality is little things do add up. And so, again, if you look at making changes in your life, really think about, okay, what could I do that if I just kept doing it? Right, might really change my life. The, the, the Tao Te Ching says, this is just one translation of it, but it says, a tree as wide as a man's embrace grows from a tiny shoot. A tower of nine stories starts with a pile of dirt. A climb of 800 feet starts where the foot stands, which is actually the origin. A different translation is the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Same principle. In 2003, um, Henry, I'm, I'm going to wonder if Henry's, what Henry's going to think of this story because now I'm treading into English culture here. I might get myself in trouble. All right. But the story is I understand it. I'll caveat it. In 2003, British cycling was terrible. Right? They had, they had endured 100 years of mediocrity. Since 1908, they'd won a single gold medal at the Olympics and across the channel in the Tour de France, a British cyclist had never won, which must have been embarrassing. <laughs> Can't resist twisting the knife a little. But then 
things changed because they hired a new coach by the name of Dave Brailsford. And Brailsford had an idea that at the time was somewhat um, different. And it was the idea of marginal gains. And what he did is he said, the whole principle was the idea if you broke down everything you could think of that goes into riding a bike and then improve those things by 1%, you'd get a significant increase when you put them all together. So they started making small adjustments like you might expect, you know, redesigning bike seats to make them more comfortable or rubbing alcohol in the tires for a better grip. They got shorts for the riders that, that were electrically heated to keep the ideal muscle temperature. Um, they tested fabrics in a wind tunnel. Um, you know, so all these little things, just a little bit of improvement. But then they didn't stop there. They started to do things like what massage gels lead to the fastest muscle recovery? And they hired a, a team, a surgeon to teach them how to wash their hands the best so they didn't get a cold. What type of pillow led to the best night's sleep for the riders? They even went as far as painting the inside of their truck, the team truck white, so they could spot little bits of dust, right? So just little teensy changes, one after the other. Five years after he took over, the British cycling team dominated the 2008 Olympics in Beijing, where they won an astounding 60% of the gold medals available. Four years later, they raised the bar and set nine Olympic records. And then that same year, they had someone, one of their cyclists, win the Tour de France. And then the next year, someone won it. So this theory, there's some content controversy around that says, look, they did more than just marginal gains. So I'm not going to say that like small 1% changes are the only way to get anywhere, but they are a real way to get somewhere. They are a real way to make change. So again, it's back to this idea of little by little, a little becomes a lot. All right. So I'm running out of time. So I want to bring this all together and talk about a couple of spiritual habits. What does this actually look like? And so I wanna use the spiritual principle of being present, of actually being mindful, being here now. Again, something that uh, in Zen we think is really, really important, right? It's a pretty, pretty core thing. And yet it's hard to do. And why is it hard to do? It's hard because we forget it's also hard because a lot of times we go, well, let me be present now. And we're like, all right, I'm now, but then, but then we're gone like that. So, so there's a couple of spiritual habits that I think can really be helpful around this, right? And so what we want to look for again with a spiritual habit is we want a little bit of the if this, then that. And we want to trigger. So a really good spiritual habit comes... Um, at least I've originally seen it come out of psychology, but it could be very much, uh, you could teach it in Zen. And it's called grounding yourself in your senses. And it is a, you, you, when you remember, you go, what are five things that I can see right now? So I might go lamp, cloud, tree, computer, Henry, right? Five things I can see. What are five things that I can hear? So I stop and listen. And what are five things that I can feel in my body? I can feel myself sitting in the chair. I can feel my throat getting a little bit dry. It's called grounding ourselves in our senses, but it's a great way to be more present. And so we can use triggers to do this. We can use the trigger that I talked about of having, you could set an alarm on your phone. You could uh, have your thing ping you randomly. You could do it every time you're at a stoplight. That's an example of a location-based trigger. Um, I used to do this every time I would walk into, uh, before I did this full-time, I had a job that was not that long ago. And every time I would walk into the building, I would do this practice. And every time I would walk out, I would do this practice. That was my trigger. Walk into work, leave work. A chance to ground myself in my senses and be present. Another type of uh, presence practice, spiritual habit, and this I am pulling straight from Zen, is Samu, right? Work practice. Work practice is a way of being present, but we don't just have to do work practice when we are on retreat or when we are at the Zendo. 
So we can pick something in our own lives that we do every day, ideally. So for me, it's dishes. I do most of the dishes. I'm lucky enough that my lovely partner and girlfriend, Ginny, is an amazing cook. She does most of the cooking, and I do all the dishes, and I think it's a very fair trade. Um, but dishes are a time for me to practice. That's my trigger. When I do dishes, then I try and be fully present. And then finally is, I want to use an example of an emotional-based trigger. So, and it goes like this. When I catch myself wishing for a different moment than the one I'm in right now, then I'm going to ask myself, what happens if I stop designating some moments as special and others as ordinary? So you can, use, you can use a reflection. You can use that one. You can use countless other ones. But what I'm doing here is if I feel like I want to be somewhere where else than I am, which I think a lot of us in quarantine can relate, relate to that, like, oh, I'm in my house again. I would love to be anywhere. And then it's, so, okay, there's my trigger. Okay, what, hap what would happen if I stopped picking some moments as special and Others is ordinary, and I saw them as all moments to be present, all special moments. So those are some examples of a couple of ways of bringing together a spiritual principle like presence and behavioral change ideas like triggers, small tasks over and over. And again, the idea of these spiritual habits that I described, as you can see, is that we can do them over and over and over again. You can ground yourself in your senses 10 times a day right? You can, every time you do dishes, and then little by little, you will deepen your capacity for presence. And we can apply these sort of things to things like generosity, to things like acceptance. You know, we can take these spiritual principles that we all believe in and we want to embody more. And by using some, some skills from behavior change, we can find ways to, to embody them and weave them more into our lives. So that I am two minutes over, but I am also done. So thank you so much, uh, Henry, for inviting me. I'm, I'm really honored to be here. And um, I am happy to, uh, if there's any questions or comments or anything, I am, I'm happy to do my best to answer them. So thank you. Eric, thank you so much. What a, what a profoundly helpful and really, um, really fascinating, uh, good time, to, I will say tour through behavior change habits and, and deepening our spiritual way i love i love that and i I've, I've particularly felt that the five things i actually sometimes do that grounding in five things in seeing and hearing and feeling and the um the dishes actually is a big one for me <laughs> I, I do i do a lot of dish cleaning in our household and it's, it's a great time and, and you, you know you may know that there's a color where Joshu, his, his guidance to a student is, wash your bowls. You know, like that's all you need to do, you know. And, um, but I don't want to talk too much. You, all, always, you guys are always hearing from me. Please, um, anybody, how should we do this? I mean, Peg, would you unmute or are people, can people unmute themselves? Actually, right I need Eric to make me the host again. All right. Let me make an attempt to do that. <laughs> Click on Mountain Cloud. Yep, I think I have done it. You did indeed. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, should we turn off the recording at this point, Henry? Uh, no, let's keep it rolling. Let's see see what comes up. We can, you know. Very good. Um, so, anybody who who would like to ask a question, I think are we just going to do it like by speech, Peg, or we could do it by chat? I think we could do it either way. I unmuted everyone. That's Eric, thank you uh, very much for sharing what you've learned along the way. Um, my question is, if you could just keep one thing in mind, what would that be? If it comes to behavior, to behavior change? Um, or even just, even just in general, more, more bigger picture. Like if there's just one thing that um, you find is, is really helpful to remember. Let me. 
I think that I'll, I'll, give you two, I'll give you two quick things. So with behavior change, I would say, I'd say um, I'm sorry, Eric, I'm interrupting you. But I want to, Peg, can you actually, can you make it so everybody's muted, but they can unmute themselves if they want to? Because okay. um, if we have everybody un unmuted, we're going to get, you know, background sounds. Right, and we are, and I was just going to address that. Um, I can unmute everyone, but ask everyone to mute themselves unless they are asking a question. Would that work? Yes. Perfect. So, so can everybody hear that? Please mute yourselves, everybody, unless you're asking a question. Thank you. Okay, so um, yeah, my two answers, if you're going to, if we're going to talk about behavior change, I would say, be specific. You know, being specific about what you're going to do, what you want to do is really, really important. And then in general, you know, I think that, you know, for me, I can only speak to, you know, my, my own my own growth, but it's a constant sort of thing to become more aware of what am I thinking and what am I feeling, you know, not so that I necessarily uh, in, engage with it as much, but so that I can at least realize it's happening. I can realize what's happening. And once I can do that, once I have some degree of consciousness of what I'm thinking and feeling, I can make a lot of choices about what do I want to do with it? How do I want to respond? You know, my Zen teacher tells me all the time, don't believe your thoughts, which is a great, great lesson. The problem is that a lot of times I'm believing them. I just don't know that I'm doing it because I'm not even conscious at that level. So for me, it's, a, it's really about this awareness of trying to take what's sort of happening somewhat subconsciously or unconsciously and unconsciously raise it up into, it up into the level of, the level of, of where of, I can see what's happening. See what's happening. Perfect. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So, uh, Eric, my name is Patrick. Can you hear me? I can. Yeah. So thanks for a really, really great talk. I really, it's given me a lot to think about um, uh, and consider and kind of mull over. But so here's what came up for me, you know, that um, can make these, I can try for these incremental or small changes. And then if what happens is if I'm not successful, it doesn't work. You know, the prompt doesn't work. Maybe that happens three or four times. I kind of get it in my head. I have this voice saying, Ah, oh, you're not you're not the kind of person who who's gonna be able to pull that off. Yeah. You no, know, so my motivation level goes down and it seems to become harder. So how do you how do you deal with that? Yeah, that is a that is a really good question and a really common problem. And I would say that you start with the assumption I'm going to fall off track. It is absolutely going to happen to everyone. So with me, with things that I'm trying to do, like I try and meditate every day. And my goal, what, I'm, what, I'm, what I consider success is 90% of the time, but that's month after month, year after year. So, you know, th what that means is over the course of a year, I could miss 36 days. I try not to, but I could and still go, you know what, if I'm not, if I'm meditating 90% of every day for the next decade, that's pretty darn good, right? So realizing that I'm not going to be perfect. So when you fall off track, which you will inevitably, whether it's your own, um, you just get unmotivated, but think life throws us off track. We're doing great. And then our mom gets sick and we got to go to the hospital for three days and there's no time to exercise. You get sick. You can't exercise, right? Inevitable, you're going to get off track. So the key is to get back on track just as fast as possible with the minimal amount of emotional drama. Because what you're describing is exactly what happens. We get a little off track and then the brain starts up and it goes, see, who are you fooling? You can't stick with exercise. I mean, you've quit every time in the past. Why is this different? 
and we know what happens. One of the things we do know about motivation, I said motivation is a difficult thing to move. We know that hope and confidence move motivation up and doubt and fear bring it down. So the minute that you allow that doubting, afraid voice to take over in your brain, down comes your motivation and it makes it less likely that you're going to get back on track. So I always say, assume you're going to get off track, plan for if I get off track, then I will do this. So have an have a implementation intention. Begin again. Begin again. Amen. <laughs> Begin again. Yes. And then just get back on track with minimal amount of of discussion about what it actually means. Because if you get back on track after three or four days, it comes out in the wash. It's absolutely insignificant in the long term. So don't believe what your brain starts to tell you. Very common though. Yep, thanks. Hopefully that's helpful. Definitely. Well, you gave us a lot of uh, information and not to be disagreeable, but uh, Moo seems much simpler. <laughs> well, on one hand, yes. And on another hand, I don't know. <laughs> but well, yes. Actually, isn't Moo a perfect case of little by little? A little can become a lot. Just Moo after Moo after Moo. <laughs> little, little, endless, tiny little moves. Just that tiny little sound. And just moo. <laughs> and just moo. <move. laughs> <laughs> Henry told me I couldn't talk about moo, though. He said, stay, stay away from moo. So I had to, I had to leave it out. <laughs> No, I just, I'm not, I'm not here to pose as a Zen teacher. That's the main thing that I'm avoiding. So, yeah. Michelle, do you have a question? Anybody else? If I think we might have time for another question if anybody's got one, but no worries if not. Let's see. Eric, how do you balance the rigidity that can come into your daily process if you're um, running uh, a really strict schedule? Like you have a lot of habit stacking, you know, you're, you're mapped out minute by minute. How do you balance that type of operating with the more, you know, casual, going with the flow, relaxed way of being? Yeah, it, that's, a, that's a really good question that, 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 that I could give about six different answers for. What I will say is that I find that sticking with any habit long term takes a curious mixture of a certain amount of strictness and a certain amount of relaxedness. Too much strictness and what happens is you, you're, you're all or nothing. Either I do it perfectly or I quit right? That doesn't work. That's where going, oh, you know, I'm shooting for about 90%. Uh, you know, I find that number to be, to be useful. So, um, but on the other hand, you've got to be, you've got to be somewhat, you know, focused on, on consistency, right? And so, um, one thing that I will, uh, there's a, there's a guy who's done a lot of work on habits called James Clear, and he has a phrase that I love, which he's off. I've heard him say, reduce the scope, but stick to the schedule. So this is a great way to say, look, if, for example, I, it's 10 at night and I realize, oh, geez, I didn't meditate today, but I'm trying to do it every day. I will give myself permission to sit down and meditate for five minutes. It's not what I normally do. That's not my ideal. But I feel like, all right, five minutes helps me to sort of keep the, keep the habit a little bit more alive. It's better than zero minutes. And a, a phrase I use often with people when we're talking about that is that a little bit of something is better than a lot of nothing. So that's one way that we can, when we find ourselves being too rigid, we can do that. Um, the, the, the bigger question about, um, about planning things down to the minute and how do you sort of plan things really 
really strictly and yet also go with the flow and all that. You know, I think that's a that's an interesting discussion. I'm one of those people who spent most of my life thinking that what I wanted more than anything was to be able to do exactly what I want whenever I want to do it. That to me was like that's the that's give me that and I'll be happy. What I've realized is if you give me that, it's a disaster. Right? So for me, structure really liberates. Right? Structure is a very liberating thing, but it's got to be the right kind. And finding what's the right amount for you that allows you to feel like, okay, you know, I like to think of structure like we think of structural beams in a house. Often we think of it as confining. I like to think of it as a, like the structural elements in a house. They hold us up. They support us. So you have to find the level of structure that works for you that allows you to feel supported, that sort of props you up, but doesn't make you feel like, oh, it's so rigid. But rigidity is often a bigger problem to making long-term behavior change than uh, actually than um, being laid back is because that all or nothing thinking is really pervasive. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, that's just fantastic, Eric. Thank you so much. Um, I think it's given us all a lot to um, to reflect on and learn from. And, you know, I'd say, you know, probably the great majority of people here tonight do already have good sort of meditation habit. But maybe, you know, I mean, I certainly, I, I learned a lot in the last 45 minutes listening to this. I really did. And, about other aspects of life as well, you know, and, and you know, new ways of looking at, at um, the meditation path. And I love what you've just been saying about the rigidity versus the flexibility and the 90%. That's all beautiful. Like building in already some scope for not doing it perfectly, you know, and, and that's lovely, lovely. Lots of lovely stuff here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank all, thank all of you for, for listening. I'm, I'm, uh, I love, I love mountain cloud and I am, I'm very happy and honored to have been able to be here. Thank you so much, Eric. And Peg, thanks for looking at us and Laura, thanks for the announcements and thank you everybody.